Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. So this morning, uh, you know, we're all getting ready for Thanksgiving, and it was interesting. I had a conversation, and and most of you know, uh, Christmas is one of those times when I, I kind of preach about Christmas. Easter's one of those times when I, I preach about Easter or the resurrection of Christ. And uh, but you know, just about any other Sunday, it's give or take. I, I, I'm not real big on uh, doing the the holiday uh, theme, but. I, I just couldn't get past uh, some of my reading this week. And what really kind of set this morning's uh, sermon in stone was uh, a conversation that I had at a um, retail store. Uh, I walked in and was looking for uh, a pair of jeans and began to talk uh, with uh, the person that was there, and they were being very helpful. And just all of a sudden, you know, he, he was like, well, what do, what do you use your jeans for? <laughs> and I was like, oh, gosh. I was like, well, I preach in, in jeans. And he's like, oh, so you need, like, dress jeans. You don't need just, like, regular work jeans. And I'm like, yeah, they, they need to be a little bit dressy, uh, I guess, because they usually go with a button-down shirt or a sweater. And he goes, um, he goes that's really neat. And I said, well, yeah. And he's like, uh, Something to the effect of how Thanksgiving was coming up, and he goes, you know, Thanksgiving kind of just gets lost anymore. And, and I'm like, okay, where are you going with this? Um, and he goes, you know, Halloween's getting so popular, and I don't even consider Halloween a, a holiday. That's, uh, you know, but anyways, it, it's getting more popular. You see people decorating for it. You see people gearing up for it. Walmart's selling stuff in, in January for it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I heard a couple laughs there. Um, so, you know, Halloween's getting more popular. And it seems like as soon as Halloween's over, uh, you see Christmas trees right next to Halloween stuff, uh, skeletons and things. It's like they're, and, and he goes, they're trying to squeeze out Thanksgiving. And he says, Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays. And so I said, I agree. Thanksgiving is one of my favorites as well. This is just something about uh, sitting around with your family, with your church, and, and giving Thanksgiving. And so he and I had a little conversation uh, about what it was, and I began to think of how important Thanksgiving really is. Because Thanksgiving, it shouldn't be just one day, and you know, we talk about that all the time. It should be something that we uh, do and recognize every day. But the idea that it's getting squeezed out uh, as a holiday is kind of showing the evidence that it's becoming less important to people. Uh, Thanksgiving is less important uh, because uh, part of there, there's a lot of different reasons, but we're going to talk about how important uh, Thanksgiving really is today. One of my favorite psalms of Thanksgiving is Psalm 100, uh, and that's what we're going to be uh, going out of uh, this morning, or, or we're going to be using as our, our uh, primary text. But it says, shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. And I know some of you guys have your translations um, that says, and this is the one we're most familiar with, right? Because this is the one we make an excuse for. Um, make a joyful noise, all the earth, right? Make a joyful noise. So it, we'll, we'll talk about that. But then it says in verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that Yahweh is God. And some of you have in your uh, text, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord is God. He made us and we are his. His people, the sheep of his pasture, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for Yahweh is good and his love is eternal. His faithfulness endures through all, gen uh, all generations. I love that psalm. You, you, you almost have to, to sing it. You almost have to, to get into the spirit of thanksgiving, especially when you get to that first part, because we all think of it. And, and, and probably most of you think of, of people like me, the people that can't sing or shouldn't sing out loud. And what do we always say, right? Well, you should just make a joyful noise. And, and if you paid attention to Pastor D Live uh, this Friday, the make a joyful noise to me is, is kind of strange because uh, I can make a joyful noise, but most people would prefer that I make it a little bit softer. <laughs> you know, don't, you know, you've all heard that one person that they, they, they're like me, they can't really sing all that well, but they're like blasting it out there. It's like, yes, make a joyful noise, but make it just a little bit quieter. Uh, okay. Well, the, this passage is going beyond uh, this idea that only certain people can really praise God or give thanksgiving. 
And, and that's one of the, the things we think, well, I can't, I can't preach, so I can't give thanksgiving. Or I'm not a good speaker, so I, uh, I can't give a, a real thanksgiving testimony. Or, or I'm not a good singer, so uh, I can't praise the Lord like some other people can. And, and we begin to get into this idea because we've gone through David, and he was a songwriter. We go through uh, him playing the lyre, so he was a musician. Well, we, we hear our praise and worship bands at, at churches, and, and those people have been gifted and given talent to, to praise God, and we get to come alongside of them. If the praise and worship team is doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're leading us in worship. They're not performing. That's one of the reasons why I like our praise and worship band so much. Yes, they are talented, but they would much rather hear you guys sing than themselves, because it is about making much about Jesus. It's making much about God, and it's not about who's on stage. It's not about who's speaking. It's not about who's singing. It's about God. That's what Thanksgiving is really and truly all about. So when we see this Psalm 100, it's just labeled that. If you've got your little labels in here, it doesn't necessarily tell you whether David wrote it or he didn't, uh, but it's just simply titled, Be Thankful, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. So I began to, to look at this passage and, and tear it apart a little bit. And, and probably the most key question here that we have to think about is who is the psalmist thanking? Who should we be thanking when we're doing our thanksgiving? Uh, as the key question, you hear even non-Christians around this time of the year saying things like, I am so thankful. Elaborate on that for me. You're so thankful. Well, I'm thankful for well, that's great, but where do you think that came from? And some people would sit and say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for my dad. You're thankful for your dad? Really? You're thankful for him. So you're admitting that you know, somebody somewhere gave your dad to you, or I'm thankful for this, or I'm thankful for that. But the key question here really is, is who? Who are we thankful for? to? Who are we thankful towards? Who are we recognizing that, that is the giver of all these great things that we have in our lives? Because when we recognize that, if it was just by chance, there's no reason to be thankful. You would just simply say, wow, I'm very fortunate. I'm very lucky. But when we think that there is someone specific out there that, that is in charge, someone that is sovereign, someone uh, who is good, someone who is merciful, someone who is faithful, someone who is just. When we think that there is someone out there that is overseeing this, someone out there that's in control of all of this, that's when we can truly understand what it means to be thankful. Because we know what it's like when your dad gives you something. Thanks for that. Thank you. Well, we hope the kids say thank you, right? Uh, when someone comes alongside you and helps you while you're working, thank you. Because someone else is doing something alongside of you or for you or with you. So we have to understand in this psalm who we are to be thankful for or towards. So it tells us this. It says, shout joyfully to the Lord. And when we look at the word Lord, I, I explained to you, some of you have in your scriptures Yahweh. Some of us have Lord, capital L, O, uh, capital O, capital R, capital D. Some may even have Jehovah. All of those words mean the same thing. One, Jehovah comes from Latin uh, and the pronunciation. Yahweh comes from Hebrew, the pr Hebrew pronunciation. And so when we get to this, the scribes uh, had so much respect for God's name that they were even afraid to write it down. They, they, they thought it deserved so much respect they couldn't even write it down. So they would put Lord, or they would put uh, something in place of it. But we begin to, to dive through Scripture, and we see in Exodus chapter 3, God wanted us to know his name. He wanted us to know his name, and so he gave it to Moses to proclaim it to the Egyptians and, and to the Israelites. God replied to Moses in verse 14 through 15, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, Yahweh. Yahweh, God's name forever. And this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. I am 
who I am. Yahweh is just four letters in the Hebrew language. Big Y, big H, big W, big H. And some I've heard say that it is a name that even a baby can speak because it is the breath that comes out of their mouths. Yahweh. It can be whispered just as you breathe in and out through life. The thing that describes who we're to be thankful for here is uh, the writer of the Psalms identifies him as the Lord himself is God. So Yahweh is God, and what that means is he is the only true God. So when we see in this passage, it's not that there might be another God that's equal to him, there might be another God that, that we might prefer, but if we really want to get down to who we are to be thankful to, it is the one true God, the Lord himself, Yahweh himself. It says in here that he is the one who made us, and it identifies in this passage that he is a shepherd. When we look at this, who are we to be thankful to? Uh, Who should we be thanking? Well, absolutely, Father God, Yahweh, uh, is is identified throughout this passage. But then I begin to look a little bit deeper. A few months ago, actually May 1st, I looked it up. Get this. You can go on our website, and you can go find past sermons from, from what we've done since COVID, since we've been on Facebook. It's really cool. It didn't even take me that long. It took me about three minutes. But Ford Campbell uh, stood up here on May 1st and described to you everything about the, the word Yahweh and Lord and his name and then tied it in to who Jesus was. Interestingly enough, we see that not only are we to be thankful to God, but I believe this passage, because of Jesus Christ, we are led to worshiping and thanking him as well. We see in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that Jesus was Yahweh. Jesus is the one true God. Jesus is the one. It is acceptable and I believe can lead us into a point of worship to thank Jesus just as much as the psalmist was thanking Yahweh because they're the same person. They're the same person. So we identify Jesus as the one true God. In John chapter 1, verse 3, we see that all things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So we can thank God for being the creator, but we can also thank Jesus for being the creator. Do you see how this is working? Do you see a picture of Jesus in, in our Thanksgiving passage this morning? We see in John chapter 10, 11 through 14, Jesus identifies himself as, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. When God, Yahweh, is identified as the shepherd in Psalm 100, we can look forward. Well, we're still looking back. (laughs) But they could look forward and begin to see Jesus as the one that we're to be thankful for. Jesus is the good shepherd just as Yahweh was the shepherd who knew his sheep and cared for his sheep. So what should we be thankful for? Well, in this passage, I I think not only do do we see a a little bit of of, uh, the things, because most uh, of what we see or most of what we're thankful for, uh, and all you have to do is spend a little bit of time around Mount Moriah Christian School at this time of the year, they do two really cool things that you have to see or or have to ask your kids or your grandkids about. One thing is, is they make their own butter. (laughs) I know. And it's, it's going to be strange the way they make it because you're, you're, you, I know what you're picturing. You're picturing all these little kids. There's probably a butter churn sitting in the middle of, of, of the room, and each kid comes by and takes a couple turns on the butter churn, right? No. Get this. If, you, if your kid ever wants to do this, it's amazing. It, it's going to take a lot because these kids work really hard at it. But you take a few marbles and you put it in a gla- uh, glass mason jar. I think I got this right. You, take a, you put those in, and then you pour a little bit of heavy whipping cream in on top of it. And then you put salt in, and then you just sit there and shake it. 
And that's all they do. But, but they, there's like 15 kids sitting around a table. Uh, and what's really cool about this is Mrs. Paschke had them going, going nuts, and they were nuts. But they're sitting there shaking this, and as they shake it, it gets a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker, and then it begins to separate, and it actually turns into butter. And you listen to all these kids talking about all the things that they're thankful for. And, and it ranges from puppies uh, to Jesus with families in between. Uh, and I'm just going to call her out right now. Uh, Bella was my favorite one this year. <laughs> and right now, Bella's mom and dad are going, oh, no. <laughs> Bella's sitting there shaking that thing, and she goes, I'm just thankful that I'm not having another brother. (laughs) But Thanksgiving, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? It's the things in your heart that, that mean the absolute most to you, and some of them can be so simple. Some of them can be so deep. Some of them can be, can, can be so superficial. And some of them can reach to the greatest matters of your heart. And it is good to be thankful for all of those things. It's good to be thankful for all of those things because God plays a part in all of that. God plays a part in all of that. He has caused it to happen or he has allowed it to happen. God is sovereign and he is in control. And there is nothing about your life, there's nothing insignificant about your life that's happening that God doesn't know about and that God doesn't care about. And that's what Thanksgiving is really, truly beginning to understand. What does the psalmist say in here? In this passage, he says he has made us. This could be a reference to God making Israel his chosen people. There's two different uh, ways that people think of it. This would have been written by, by an Israelite. So it could have been that they're thankful that God chose me to, to, to make his love evident to the world. That could have been the mindset that was going behind this psalm. Or it could have been down to the absolute basic. I am just so thankful that God created me. The reason I'm here is because God made me, period. Either way, it is so deep uh, of a thing to think about. If God had not thought of you, if God had not purposed you, you wouldn't be here, period. But then to think, God loves you and desires you and wants to make you one of his people, both of those are incredible things to be thankful about. Psalm 139, 13 through 16, the psalmist again says, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because you have been remarkable. I was, I'm sorry. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place and when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All the days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. The psalmist is thankful. Is thankful because God made him and God purposed him even before he was formed in his mother's womb. You too. Me too. God knew you, had thought of you, and put you into being, but not only put you into being, but had your life planned. So he knows where you are right now. He knows what you're doing right now. He knows what you're thinking right now. And he knew before he created you. Think of this. He still created you. (laughs) I think of some of the things in my life Man, and the psalmist thought of this, and and Job thought a little bit about this, and what is my life? What is it that God would even care about me? But this passage, these two passages together show that God loved you, and he knew what trouble you were going to get in, and he loved you enough to create you, and even more so, he loved you enough to send his son for you, regardless 
of who you think you are, regardless of how worthless you think you are, regardless of how sinful you think you are, God still made you and God still loves you. It's amazing. It's amazing. We should be thankful that we're his sheep. Psalm 23, we don't read this one very often other than at funerals. But Psalm 23 is one that we're really, uh, we're really familiar with. Uh, this is one of the, the ones as David was writing, uh, he was familiar with what a shepherd would do, and he began to recognize the, the characteristics and the traits that he would demonstrate towards the sheep. God would do it perfectly in his life. And this is what David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They, you've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. David was thankful that God was his shepherd. That David was one of God's people. When we look Throughout Scripture, we see Jesus in comparing himself to this shepherd. Even Jesus thanked God that his sheep would hear his voice and would know him. And that's what the psalmist knew. God knew when he needed rest. God knew when he needed discipline. I need rest. I need discipline. God knew when he would needed to be encouraged. And so not only did Jesus come to be the good shepherd, but when Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I will send my comforter. I will send someone to take care of all the things that I was doing here personally for my disciples, but I'm going to do them each individually for my children and for my sheep from this point on through my Holy Spirit. Something to be thankful for that God is our shepherd and he's never left us uncared for. We see that he is thankful for God's goodness. We understand through scripture that God knows how to give good gifts. But the thing that he, he demonstrates here in this passage that, that res resonates throughout history is his faithful love. God's faithful love, Yahweh's faithful love. And, and we say, well, what does that faithful love look like? Well, faithful means that he keeps his promises. And love means that he is compassionate. And when we look at those, God compassionately keeps his promise. Well, what promise? Well, he made a promise to Abraham that he would be the father of the nations. Uh, he made a promise that, that there would be a Messiah. He made a promise uh, that there would be the Holy Spirit would come. And all of the promises that we see in Scripture, we have seen fulfilled over and over and over again to where God has never broken one promise. Not one. So we understand the faithfulness. Well, where do we see his love? He's faithful, sure, he keeps his promises, but sometimes maybe I don't feel like God loves me. Well, we don't have to worry about how we feel, and I believe that that's kind of what the psalmist was talking about here. There, there are going to be times when you're going through hard and difficult valleys, but the faithful love never leaves us, never is taken away from us. And when we see it mostly in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrated or proved his faithful love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God was going to break his promise, if God was going to be unfaithful in his love, he would have picked me. He would have picked me. Because of all the things that I've done in my life, all the sin that existed in my life, if the psalmist would have believed that this unfaithful love could be taken away, he would in no way have prayed in Psalm 51 about restoring a clean or, or providing a clean heart and restoring uh, the joy of his salvation. He understood, he understood that God's love would be proven over and over and over again. And if we ever doubted it, we could look at the cross and understand, if I'm going to keep my promise, I'm going to keep my promise. If I have to send my son, I'm going to send my son. I want you to understand that I will never stop loving you. And I will do absolutely everything 
I will withhold nothing good to prove to you that I love you. It's God's faithful love that he's thankful for. If for nothing else, we see salvation. The salvation is actually the result of God's unfailing love. So we don't see salvation in this passage necessarily, but I'm going to show you a little bit later as to how we can tie it back into. But the result of God's unfailing love, if you repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, is a salvation that you can't earn and a salvation that you don't deserve. But that is what's so awesome about God's unfaithful love in the first place. But that salvation is the thing that we most need to be thankful for, especially if we've already experienced it. It is the thing that we should most uh, desperately look for and search for. But it's the most important thing in the life of a human being. Because we can follow Because of all of those things, we can follow the command that Paul gives to the Thessalonians. Because of his unfaithful, because of his faithful love, because of his goodness, because of us being able to be called his people, because of of his creating us and knowing us, because of all those things, we can follow this command. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You say, sometimes I don't feel like being thankful. I'm sick. Sometimes I don't feel like being thankful. Uh, I'm in a broken relationship. Sometimes I don't feel like being thankful. I've lost loved ones. Sometimes I don't feel like being thankful because uh, this isn't where or who or what I wanted to be. But if you know Christ, when you're in Christ, we can see, just as this psalmist sees, we can see that we're still his people, that he is still good that he still faithfully loves us, that our salvation is sure, and that God has made us and purposed us. Those are the things that we can be thankful for in any situation or any circumstance. Those are the things we're to focus on. Those are the things that we're to, to, to be thankful for continually. Well, how do we express the thanksgiving? Well, this, this passage gives us uh, a lot of different ways to, to express our thanksgiving. It doesn't include, although I, I really do like the idea of sitting down and eating and talking about all the things I'm thankful for. I really like the sitting down and eating part. But the making a joyful noise. If we look at, at the King James Version, the English Standard Version, those are the, the two that I read that uh, they, they talk about making a joyful noise. What it really is saying is this. It's not singing yet, which I, I, I appreciated that. <laughs> it's not about singing quite yet. It's just simply about making a public proclamation, saying it out loud. It's a testimony. Make a joyful noise just means every opportunity you get, you say out loud or you demonstrate out loud what God has been doing, is doing, and will do, continue to do in your life. The second thing that we see the psalmist using in here is we're to serve the Lord with gladness. And and this word serve in here is actually an act of obedience. So being obedient to God's word is one way that we can show and demonstrate our thanksgiving. You know, when I give my kids something and, and expect them to, to go out, and it, it, it might be the greatest thing in the world. But if they misuse it, if they use it in such a way that might hurt themselves or someone else, there are little rules that come along with some of those gifts, right? Him being obedient shows how thankful he is. You say, well, that kid never told me thank you, but he wears his helmet every time he goes out on his motorcycle. That's a good thing. He's thankful. He understood what you gave him and the respect and the responsibility that comes along with it. You you buy him a a new car. They wear their seatbelt every time. That is an act of obedience because you've asked them to do that. And, And so they understand the responsibility and the restraint within that gift, and they use it in such a way that brings honor and safety to your family. God's kind of the same way. There are commands that he has given in his word not to earn our salvation, but that we can demonstrate how thankful we are that he's made those things possible in our lives, that he's given those things in our lives. So obedience, serving the Lord with gladness, and it's not uh, this obedience that says, oh, I guess I have to, because that wouldn't be very glad, would it? 
but it's using and doing those things with joy, with a gladness in your heart. I don't have to, I get to. It is one way to look at it. The third way that we see that we should express our our thanksgiving in this passage is we're to come into his presence with singing. Finally, (laughs) finally, we're singing. Uh, we're, We're to joyfully sing together. And what this is talking about is our acts of worship. And it's not the joyful song in and of itself. And I immediately, as I I was studying this part, immediately thought about Matt Redmond's song. And we sing this one often here at Mount Moriah. But the whole beginning part of it, 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 it's not the idea that it's just the music, but it is our heart in worship. And so when our heart is in worship, Matt Matt Redmond writes this, When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart, I'll bring you more than a song. So it's not just the singing that we do, but it's everything that we're thinking and everything that is being poured out from our heart. It is an offering. You know, we sit here and we take singing for granted. And you really do. Some of you that can do it well, you take it for granted. Because nobody wants to hear me sing. You wouldn't want me up here leading you uh, in praise and worship. If you did, I'm, I'm a little concerned. But what you love, and this is what, and and I say this, I don't listen to a lot of Christian artists. I don't. Uh, Because some of them, when I hear what they're singing, and I see some of the stuff that they're saying or that they're doing, I reevaluate. And I'm like, "Ah." but there are some Christian singers, Christian songwriters, man, you know their heart? You know their heart, and that praise and worship begins to be something different. It's not the words that they're singing, but it's that you know they believe it. You know they're living it out. It's what I love, and I'll, set, I'll shout this out. It's what I love about our praise and worship bands here at Mount Moriah. Because it's not about their voices, although they're great. But these people love the Lord. And they're doing it as an act of thanksgiving. And not only are they doing it as an act of thanksgiving, they're leading you into worship in an act of thanksgiving. And when our hearts unite, it doesn't matter how bad I sing. It doesn't matter how bad we sing. It's an offering of thanksgiving to God. It's incredible when those things come together in our hearts begin to worship together. The voices sound great, guys, but it's your hearts I appreciate. It's your hearts that God's looking at and listening to. Tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. What this is demonstrating or showing is thanksgiving and praise happened outside of the temple, not inside the temple, in the courts and the gates around. So this should have been the loudest place in the world. Uh, It should have been one of the greatest uh, places. You know, you hear in Seattle, the 12th man, if you've ever been, and I have been, to Three Rivers Stadium, and they begin to to play the music and the Steelers are winning, that place can get loud. Uh, I mean, any stadium I've ever been, been in you let the team that's uh, the home team you get going in the right direction and it's deafening wouldn't it be nice to have our churches letting out some deafening sounds in praise and worship for god I think the, this temple courts, the, they should have been the loudest and noisiest places in the world because that's where thanksgiving took place. And when we see that these, uh, what would happen is it, it wasn't something that was designated to one specific day. What it really was is it's describing this offering or this sacrifice that was called the peace offering. Psalm 116, 17 through 19 describes it. I will offer you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. You see the obedience in the presence of all his people in the courts in the, of the Lord's house within you, Jerusalem. Hallelujah. This would fall under that category of the peace offering, what is being talked about here, the, this act of thanksgiving. It would be given in the event of salvation. 
specifically, according to uh, gotquestions.org, specifically to salvation from distress, death, and sickness. So when you would overcome uh, something that is uh, anxiety or or things like that, you would realize the deliverance that God had provided and you would take an offering, uh, an animal, to the temple and outside the courts, you would sacrifice it, and then the priest would actually eat this meal with you. And and what I thought was interesting is you had to consume the entire animal at one sitting. So I'm sitting there thinking, man, you either have to have a lot of friends with you uh, if you're really thankful uh, or, or, you know, you you have to come hungry, right? Um, Is is kind of what I was thinking, but we see how this would work. And, And so when they would bring these offerings in and these would be made, it was talked about all the way back in Leviticus It says, now is the law of the fellowship sacrifice that someone may present to the Lord. If he presents it for thanksgiving in addition to the thanksgiving sacrifice, he is to present unleavened cakes mixed with olive oil, unleavened wafers coated with oil, well-kneaded cakes of fine flour mixed with oil. Uh, He is to present as his offering cakes of unleavened bread with his thanksgiving sacrifice of fellowship. From the cakes he is to present one portion of each offering as a contribution to the Lord, and it will belong to the priest who splatters the blood of the fellowship offering. It is his. The meat of this thanksgiving sacrifice of fellowship must be eaten on the day he offers it. He may not leave any of it until morning. I mean, that's a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty intense thing. But if I've been, I've been to a few of your Thanksgiving celebrations here at Mount Moriah, and, and I know ours are kind of like that. When there's food, uh, we usually have leftovers for like weeks. No leftovers here. <laughs> no Tupperware containers and no Ziploc bags. This is something that we are to be so into worshiping, so into Thanksgiving, so into fellowship, to the point where we should be inviting everyone to come and celebrate the life that God has given you, the salvation God has given you, the resources that God has given you. You say, well, that might get pretty expensive. But that's the whole idea, the sacrifices and offerings. It was to cost them something. It was to cost them something. Well, why? Well, think of what it cost God to give it to you. (laughs) That's the way I began to think about it. We sit there and complain uh, uh, about, uh, you know, paying taxes, but our, our government protects us. Our government provides for us. So we pay our taxes begrudgingly, right? You better be paying your taxes. That's obedience. But we do it begrudgingly because we, we doubt or maybe we don't think the government's doing what they're supposed to do. I don't care what your mindset is with the government, but I want you to think about it this way with the Lord. He's given you his son. He's given you his most precious. And we should be thanking him. And if it costs us something occasionally, we should be willing to sacrifice. We should be willing to bring an offering. It should cost us something. The other attitude of this, maybe it isn't just simply bringing uh, this animal to be sacrificed, but just a heart of gratitude or a word of thanks. Again, I think Matt Redmond's song kind of sums that up. It's more than what we bring It's what our heart is feeling. It's how our heart is towards God. And then the psalmist ends with this, that we are to give thanks to him and bless his name. The best way that we can bless God's name is to be good children. Is to be good children. Think about it. The best way your child could bless your family name is to go out and be obedient and behave in such a way that you aren't embarrassed, right? I've, I love hearing people say that. You, you kid, I have good kids. They never once embarrassed me, and I'm not sure if that was true, but it's interesting how many people would say it. They never did anything to really embarrass me. And then some of us are sitting there thinking, wow, I embarrass my parents all the time. We should be thankful for God's love because there have been times when we've embarrassed him but he still loves us, and he still calls us to be thankful. I want you guys to celebrate Thanksgiving in a little bit of a different way this year. I want you to make sure that your hearts are right. I want you to invite everyone to celebrate with you what God has given and what God has done for you. And I'm looking at a room full of people, and I know this Thanksgiving is going to be hard for a lot of us. 
It doesn't get any easier. It doesn't get any easier. But focus. Focus on the idea that God has made you. That God loves you. God has been faithful to you. And God will never break his promise to you. Be thankful in all circumstances. Worship him. Worship him. Thank him for the opportunities that you've had. And thank you. And thank him for the people that he has placed within your life to encourage you. And then invite them to come alongside you and celebrate and th- be in thanksgiving with you. God, Thanksgiving sometimes is, one, is the greatest time of the year, and, and for some, sometimes it's the, it's the most dreadful. Just because of, of who we're missing or, 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 or what we've uh, experienced. And God, I, I feel that, I do. Um, because there are people in my life that I miss, and I just feel like I need to pray for those families. Um, And I want to encourage them. Because the one thing that we really have to be thankful for is the salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the eternal life that you've provided for those who believe. And along with that promise, the idea knowing that those people have already entered into their eternal life, they've passed from this earth to the next. Part of the promise that you have made, have been faithful to keep, and will be faithful to keep forever, is that we can be with them again someday because of the sacrifice that your son made on the cross. We're looking forward to the day when we celebrate Thanksgiving with you every day for eternity after your son returns and reunites us all with our loved ones. God, Even though our hearts are heavy, help us to be thankful, knowing that you love us, that you care for us, and what you've provided for us in your eternal life. Thank you, God. And it's your name we pray. Amen. (laughs) 